Thank you for joining us for this session. Uh, so, Prime Minister Sanchez, if I may begin with you first. Um, how do we move forward against the climate emergency at a time when governments must also deal with the global energy, food, and finance crises? Well, I, I was um, speaking with Melissa, uh, Melinda, before, before this um, event, and uh, I think the major political risk that we are facing is uh, uh, the rise of some voices that use these excuses. I mean, this crisis as an excuse to reduce mm. their commitment uh, mm. on green transition yeah. and climate change. Yeah. Yes. So, in a way, what they say is, well, uh, climate change, or for instance, gender equality, yeah. are things for uh, you know uh, situations where we face economic uh, development, uh, yeah. not crisis. Uh, so we uh, put aside all these uh, challenges yeah. because we need to. Uh, focus on the important things. Yes. The important things are not climate change or gender equality, but others. I don't know which ones. Yeah. Always to, something else. To stick to the status quo. Yeah. So I think that, that that's the major the major risk. And how do we fight against this risk? I think we have to redouble our commitment yeah. on green transition and gender equality. Yes. We need to face this challenge, saying we are going to accelerate our commitments yeah. and to align. Uh, our responses to this energy crisis to the major crisis, which is climate change. And that means adaptation, as Prime Minister said before, finance resources, and lastly, uh, accelerate our uh, uh, renewable energy process. And this is what we're doing in this area. Wonderful. And how do you get the will? Because you, we know what needs to be done, but bringing the will around that can be the hardest part. I mean, I, I, I saw a a big change when I spoke with the private sector before the pandemic and after the pandemic. Mm. Before the pandemic, the private sector, the old industry, the traditional industry was very reluctant to, the, uh, to, to, to face the modernization of the industry and, uh, and, and, and focus on the green transition. But after the pandemic, things changed. Yeah. And also, for instance, in my country during the summer, people realized since we had you know, uh, heat waves, uh, fires, uh, droughts in, in Spain and all around Europe, consequences of climate change and consequences of not acting against climate change. Mm. So I think in a way people need positive narratives on what does it mean, uh, this green transition, and to make a, 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 an inclusive uh, a green transition. Yeah. Uh, this is what we are trying to do in Spain. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Bill, if I could come to you next. Um, low and middle income countries, as we know, are facing some of the most extreme effects of climate change. What should governments globally be doing now to help mitigate these impacts? Well, it is an irony that the problem is entirely created by the emissions of uh, the rich countries yes. and the upper middle income countries. Yeah. Uh, and so, the worst effects, many of them will come near the equator where you have uh, farmers who have very small amounts of land. And sadly, what we're seeing today, you know, is not the end of it. The warming's gonna continue until we actually uh, bring those emissions down. So that's where this, the relative role of adaptation that is helping these people versus the money we need to put into mitigation uh, comes to play. I will say that the, being able to measure various adaptation investments, uh, the world is not very sophisticated right now. Mm. Uh, in the year 2000, in health, uh, we weren't very sophisticated, yeah. but a fantastic job was done at really looking at the causes of death and what new vaccines were needed and how we could get those out there. And so things like the Global Fund, uh, where Spain's made a a very generous contribution, and later this afternoon, other countries <laughs> uh, will get a chance uh, to do that as well. Uh, uh, the vaccine fund came along, and so we really uh, had best practices where we could prove to donors we're saving lives yeah. for less than $1,000 per life saved. Yeah. With adaptation, you know, is it flood walls, is it uh, new seeds? Agriculture will certainly feature, uh, because a lot of those who are suffering uh, are 
uh, farmers with very little amounts of land. So fortunately, there are some ideas there. Mm. Uh, but adaptation is, is at an early stage and a lot of good thinking about what are the high impact steps we can take. We won't get as much money as is being demanded, but we should come as close as we possibly can. Or there, you, know, you could have just a complete breakdown in the dialogue uh, between the, the upper income Some countries, countries and, and the rest. And, and, and if that were to happen, what then needs to happen after that to move the conversation forward? Well, the one good thing about climate change is that it's not just happening in the equatorial regions. I think Everybody part of the reason the voters yeah. uh, have some empathy there is that these heat waves and droughts and forest fires are even affecting yeah. the United States and Europe. It's yeah. more acute. You know, these Pakistani floods are unbelievable. unbelievable. I mean, I, you know, I understand that things in Pakistan are tough, but now they've become super uh, difficult. And that, you know, some of that would have happened, but climate change accentuated that quite a bit. So I think, you know, when people feel engaged, um, you know, HIV, because it was a worldwide epidemic, that really helped create the Global Fund. Malaria got, you know, put in there, even though the direct experience of malaria in, you know, rich companies countries was gone a long time ago. Uh, and so in a world of digital, can you really take uh, the challenges in developing countries and make them more visible? Yeah. Or if you overdo it, and it's kind of a negative message when people are dealing with challenges, do you, do you make them tune out? And yeah. you know, the goalkeepers are uh, creative uh, about how we get that moral message across without uh, making it something you just don't even want to hear about. Yeah, totally. Thank you. So, Melinda, if I can come to you. I know how much gender equality is an area of passion for you yeah. and an area of focus. Um, so can we talk about food insecurity sure. and how that's impacting women and girls most, unfortunately? Um, what are some of the things governments can do right now to ensure that they are not left behind? Well, let me say this first. Mm. <laughs> To share the stage with Prime Minister Sanchez and Motley, yes. who are both working these issues, is, is really tremendous. And, and as you see, they're being strategic, not just in their own countries, but mm. for the world. Yeah. And so my hope is that there's a goalkeeper sitting in the audience today who someday will be taking the stage here with, as, yeah. as a Prime Minister. <laughs> um, let me say this, in terms of gender and climate and, and what are, where I really think about it is in the farmers I've met, say for instance on the continent of yes. Africa or northern India, yep. what they will tell you is the rains are coming more often at different times, they're flooding, they're getting drought, so they want access, rightfully so, to pest resistant seeds, drought resistant seeds, flood resistant seeds. Yep. But if we get those seeds and we just put them out in the system and we assume all the farmers will get them, it's a false assumption. About half the farmers are women, but the seed systems and these agricultural, what we call extension workers who teach you all the new things yeah. about cropping and farming, they are mostly men, men. and they yeah. mostly reach men. Yeah. So we've already got a problem right there. So we need to make sure we teach more um, agriculture extension workers to reach women. We need more women as agriculture extension workers. And then the second and last thing I'll say is we need women in the field trials when we trial new things like mm. a bean that's yes. more nutritious. Yeah. Women will tell you, I want that bean for my, my family, but if it's gonna take me an hour longer to cook it a day, yeah. it's a non-starter because <laughs> they don't have another hour in their day. They have no. too much on their plate. Totally. So women have a strong role to play in this, both as farmers and as the ones who cook and put the meal often on the table. Totally. And, and what's the education piece that needs to happen with the men? It's just helping them understand that there are female farmers. They know that they're out there, yeah. but they have to go the extra mile wow, to, reach to reach them. And they can. And they can. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, Melinda. So if I can come to you next, please, uh, Prime Minister Motley. Uh, you recently convened leaders in your country's capital, Bridgetown, yep. a place I like very much, may <laughs> I say. Um, and, and the idea was to test new ideas around global finance and, and building um, Barbados's economy. 
Um, can we talk about some of the areas that you touched on in your speech in terms of climate and debt? What are the new and viable ideas coming out of that meeting, and how may they help us better respond to well, these interlocking To crises? begin with them, a lot of them are unsexy. I'm not going to get into the technical jargon in here. Um, <laughs> and one of them was the SDRs, yeah. to which I spoke just now. Um, how do we get more money into the multilateral development banks? And how do we get a different compact yeah. so that we understand that you can't finance development with seven-year money? Yes. You need 30, 40-year money to finance development. And, and this nonsense of asking us to do it in seven years, I gave you the example why it shouldn't happen with what happened in the UK okay, and Germany, Germany in the last century. Similarly, there are other things that are easy that don't require money. Um, Barbados is the largest issuer of um, natural disaster clauses in sovereign bonds. Mm. Um, our bonds, if I get hit, and God forbid, please pray for us as we pray for the people of Turks and Caicos today and the people of Puerto Rico and Guadalupe and others, um, immediately we can suspend our debt service for two years mm -hmm. in order to be able to create the fiscal space mm. for us to deal with the uninsured and the underinsured in our countries but at the same time, the lender of the money is kept whole by us paying him back with an extra That's two years at the end. Now, this doesn't cost anybody anything. And what it does is actually provide greater certainty to the person who has lent, because all like now, the people who have lent Puerto Rico and Guadeloupe and Turks today are worrying, are they going to be able to pay after this event? So that is critical. This week, we're also issuing blue bonds um, Barbados is buying back $150 million of our 500 million euro bond, and we're being, having it guaranteed by the Inter-American Development Bank and mm. Nature Conservancy to allow us to be able to finance with the interest savings a marine conservation trust that will allow us to manage 30% of our marine environment yeah. um, and, and, and to have it managed between natural gas, um, the normal marine diversity, etc. But the important point is that we've put in there now a pandemic clause. Mm. Because had we had a pandemic clause in the last two years, yeah. we would not have been talking about a debt service suspension initiative of $12 billion, wow. while the G7 countries, sorry, would have, <laughs> would have, <laughs> would have, I know, and the G20, Just would, would, have, would have done quantitative easing in trillions of dollars. Yeah. You've left. 80 countries to be able to share in 12 billion. Had you had pandemic clauses that would cost nothing, you would then have had a situation where as much as a trillion dollars would have been unlocked to the 80 developing countries. Yeah. The power of the pen is mightier than the sword. Mm. And if we can make different changes in how we structure these documents and these loan agreements, we can immediately unlock trillions of dollars to the developing and to middle-income countries and low-income countries instead of believing that we should keep the world set in an imperialistic order, as I keep saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, the work that you're leading in Barbados, Prime Minister Motley, is, is very much seen as the benchmark for, for how other nations in terms um, of the low and middle income countries mm. can structure their finance. Mm. How are you ensuring that this model and the template that you're creating can be passed to other countries? Well, we're sharing it with everyone. Yeah. And we want everybody. I mean, I don't get anything by asking you to agree to natural disaster clauses because I already have it in my bonds. Yeah. And, and sharing pandemic because I want the neighborhood, as I was saying to Bill earlier, if we do well, but everyone else in the neighborhood is suffering, yes. we will eventually suffer. Totally. So look, we have to have one for all and all for one. Mm. And that's the spirit that we need in this world today more than ever, because the world is globally interdependent. Now, why do I say so? Because when we speak, when we put orders in, people say, oh, that's too small for us to deal with. Next country. So you have Caribbean countries making commitments to net zero, mm -hmm. but we can't get access to the batteries to be able to ensure that we can do the kind of renewable energy on every household mm -hmm. that we want to do. We have Caribbean countries saying we want to buy electric cars, but Europe or North America will say, well, those, we don't have enough for ourselves, so we can't, can't export yeah. to you. 
So until we have a global compact that is fair and equitable, both in terms of not only financing, but access to supply of goods, access to all of these other things, it's not going to happen. And then finally, we need investment. And we need investment because we don't want to be mendicant and we don't want to be dependent on aid. We want to earn our way through this world. And that is why the discussion on climate has to be nuanced. At the end of the day, we want to be able to get to as much renewables as possible. But 2050, the International Energy Agency says, you're still going to have 20% fossil fuels. Can you afford to exclude countries in Africa, the Caribbean, and Latin America who may have natural gas at the very time that Europe needs natural mm. gas from being able to exploit it, in the absence especially of the capacity to get to renewables in the timelines that we want to get? There's a disconnect between commitment and capacity in the world, and regrettably, there is no central body that is coming to work every day to address these issues. And we're going to lose the, the, the confidence of the global population if we don't have a mature discussion with people. Brilliant. As ever, <laughs> Prime Minister is really clear on what needs to be done. Um, and a perfect note to end our conversation on. So uh, if you could join me in thanking Melinda French Gates, Prime Minister Sanchez, Prime Minister Motley, and Bill Gates. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.